are currently in a series, Beyond Transition, Things That Never Change. We've uh, looked at God's Word that never changes. Then we studied God's wisdom that never changes. Last week, we looked at God's way that never changes. And today, at God's will, we can know God's will and that never changes changes. However, we might ask, how can a person determine God's will for our lives as we make decisions? And there are various ways people have done this. I read of a lady in Los Angeles who debated if she should take a trip to New York City. She uh, talked to her travel agent, and uh, he said, yes, it would be, be a great experience for you, and you can leave uh, L.A. and just a wonderful time on American Airlines, which has a good reputation, and would take you to J.F. Kennedy, and you'll be able to ride a 747, a newer one, and it should be a great experience. Sign on the line. She says, no, 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 I need to sleep on this. I need to think about this and uh, seek God's will, and so she uh, went to bed and prayed, God, you know, show me your will. And sure enough, in the morning he did. Because as she awakened, she turned and looked at her digital clock, and there it said, 747 a a American Airlines. It didn't say UA for United or DL for Delta, but American Airlines. And of course, she went to New York City and had a great time. Then I read of a college student. She was uh, going to buy a car, and she didn't know what kind of a car to get or where she should get. And so she, again, went to bed one night and says, God, you've got to lead me to the right car. And that night she dreamt. She had a dream, and everything in the dream was yellow. Wherever she was yellow, everything was yellow. The flowers were yellow. The weeds were yellow. The buildings were yellow. The, the trains were yellow. Everything was yellow. And so the morning when she got up, she looked for a car, and the first car she bought was a yellow car. And so uh, she purchased that first yellow car that she saw, and uh, as you might know, the yellow car was a lemon. <laughs> then uh, there was this deacon who was appointed pastor, uh, one of the pastors in the church, and, and he was uh, very hesitant because he did not have a theological degree. And so um, they said, well, you know, uh, I don't know what I should do. I, I just need this degree, and I can't go back to seminary. That's three or four years. And uh, so someone said, hey, go online. You can buy a degree online for about 25 bucks. And they gave him the w website, and so he went on, the, and he thought, well, should I buy this degree? Should I purchase this degree online, or should I not? And uh, he just was wondering, asking for God's wisdom, for God's leadership, for God's will. And sure enough, as he read 1 Timothy 3, he found out in verse 13, for they that have used the office of a deacon will, will purchase to themselves a good degree. Uh, King James Version. And so he got his degree and became a pastor. Well, you say, those are foolish things. And uh, so I would say, well, okay, yeah, they're foolish. Well, how do you determine God's will? How do you do that? Now, there's a key nine key words in the passage of Scripture that was read, well, I thought it was read this morning. Did you see he skipped nine words when he read Scripture? Key words. Why would he do that? You think someone told him to? I doubt that. But um, anyway, yeah. You know, if you were just listening to the Scripture, it sounded fine. That portion of Scripture in Colossians reads just fine without nine words. Makes sense. But if you go back, there were nine words in there that are really key to understanding God's will. And they are simply these. Let the peace of God rule in your hearts. Nine words that uh, you can kind of use as you're trying to determine God's will for your life. Because of the word rule there comes from uh, is the word we get umpire from. So you could kind of read this, let the peace of God be the umpire in your hearts. And you know, as you go to a, a game, the, you know, there's a decision, is this right or, or, or is it wrong? And, and so you have all the confusion, which is the right, which is the right answer and so on. Who, and, but the umpire makes that decision and immediately everybody agrees. And, well, maybe not agree, but it brings peace. I mean, if that's the decision, that's the way it is. And the peace comes to the confusion. That's the idea in this verse, 
that, that the peace of God should rule in your hearts. When you come to try to find God's will, you look for something that brings that sense of peace. Ah, yes, this is right. And God sort of gives that peace that umpires in your heart. Well, um, trying to find that peace are some things you need to consider. First of all, we need to be open to God's leadership. It's kind of interesting that people will believe Christ is a Savior. No problem at all. They will trust Christ as Savior. But when it comes to being Christ being Lord and really trusting him and letting him uh, know, uh, let him tell us his will and following his will, we're, we're kind of a little hesitant about that. It's okay to be saved, but... But to put ourselves in the hands of this God as far as the rest of our lives are concerned here on earth, there sometimes is a question about that. A number of years ago, a young man came to me. He had a profession, but he sensed God was was leading him, and and he wanted to know God's will. And I can still see myself. This is in another church in another state. I was sitting behind my desk. He's sitting across from my desk, desperately wanting to know God's will. What is God's will for me? So I asked him a question. I said, if you knew God's will for you, would you do it no matter what it is? And he said, I'm not sure. You got to think about that. So he went his way. You, You see, when we open ourselves to God and his will, we have to be willing to do it. And the reason some people are afraid to do that is because of their concept of God. I think it was a few weeks ago I asked you to picture in your mind God's face, if he had a face, what it would look like. And I said, knowing a lot of Christians, uh, the face would have looked something like this. That God, to some people, remember, is a killjoy, he's kind of mad. And, he's a, and so, uh, of course, if I'm going to turn my life over to a God who's who is a killjoy, and say, God, I'll do whatever you want me to do, I can see where that, hey, I don't want anything to do. I'll do my own will before I open it to that kind of a God. But we learn that that's not the kind of a God we have. And we need to remember that God's face looks more like this, that God's a a God who loves us and he wants the very best for us. And so the concept of God determines whether or not you are going to be open to his leadership. In trying to be open to his leadership, remember two things about this God who has a smile on his face. First of all, remember God's character. We read in John chapter 1, verse 18. No one has ever seen God, but his only son, who is himself God, is near to the Father's mind He has told us about him. We learn here that Jesus is close to the Father's mind. The Father is one who is omniscient. He knows everything. And so John's saying, remember that when you trust Jesus for your daily guidance, that he's next to the mind of God. He knows what you're saying. Well, I don't think that's what it says. Yeah, it makes sense that You know, Jesus knows everything and can guide us, but that's not the point here. Notice what it says is near to the Father's, everybody, heart. The King James Version goes like this. No man hath seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. A bosom there is a King James word for heart. And is speaking here of love and of mercy and compassion that Jesus is near the heart of God, the heart of God is love, mercy, and compassion. And then you have the word declared there, which in the Greek is exegetima, or the word from which we get exegete. And exegete means take something and you open it up, or you take something and you show it. And so what he's saying here is that when Jesus came to the earth, he showed us not just the mind of God, but he showed us the heart of God. And when you look at Jesus, indeed, that's what he did. You have miracle after miracle showing compassion and love and mercy as he made the blind to see and the ears to hear and the, the deaf to, to or the mute to speak and the lame to walk and the dead to live and Christ himself finally dying and rising again for us. Everything he did showed us what God was like and the character of God is love and mercy. 
So you can kind of think of God when it comes to leadership as the heart of God is where God's reaching down with his hand and he takes the hand of the sinner and he brings salvation, but then he doesn't let go. He keeps holding your hand and leading you throughout life. John, or John says in chapter 10, verse 10, that Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and have it to the fullest. He wants to lead us, not just to save us, but to lead us, and we can be sure that he will lead us according to his heart. Another um, key word here is the, the word purpose. Remember not only that he is character is that of love, but also that he's working for our purpose. Romans 8, 28. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him who have been called according to his purpose, to be conformed to the likeness of his Son. Two key words there, purpose and good. God has a purpose for us, and that purpose is good. Uh, You might imagine um, someone with a bow and an arrow and assume the target is uh, God's purpose for your life. If you take the bow and you shoot, you're going to miss it. uh, you know, you just, you don't really know what the best purpose is, and we can shoot it all the time, the arrows, and we'll always miss. But if we say, okay, Lord, you take the arrow and you shoot it, he'll be bullseye every time. Because he knows our purpose, and it's good. So when we understand the character of God, we're able to um, leave our ha- ourselves in his hands and trust him to lead us according to his purpose, which is, well, it's good. And we know that from Scripture. But I don't know about you, as you look at maybe your life and the life of somebody else, and they're believers and they're living for Christ, and, and you say, I, I wonder, you know, I mean, they've given the bow and arrow to the Lord, and he has shot the bullseye, he's fulfilling his purpose in their lives to conform them to himself, but it doesn't look good. It looks almost evil at times. And so you might look at yourself and you say, well, God, I don't understand. I don't understand this. How can this be good? Have you struggled with that? When I became legally blind on my left eye and went through that whole time and uh, thought, you know, Lord, I, I don't understand. I need my eyes to read and to drive. And uh, I really struggled with that more than I think anything else in my life, why God permitted me to lose half my sight. But I cope and uh, do quite well, but, but is that good? And as a pastor... Uh, soon be uh, 50 years that I walk with people through life and uh, you see them going through difficult times and you begin to say, well, now, they're believers, they're trusting the Lord, and then this person dies an untimely death? Or um, when I was uh, early a pastor, I remember the first baby I buried, uh, SIDS, uh, the uh, Sudden Infant Death Syndrome, Twins, and um, Jonathan and David, and uh, and David lives, and Jonathan dies, and and I remember standing in the cemetery out there in New Jersey, saying, "How could this be good? This couple's broken, and they finally had these little boys." And and year after year, you go through this past week going visiting people that are are suffering, just suffering, and they can't seem to die, and they're good people, and you think, my goodness. And you know they've given their, the bow and arrow to God, and you know that he has, has shot the arrow to the perfect purpose for their lives. It reminds me of the time when I was about 24. I was taking my first permanent church. I sat down with the district superintendent, and Dr. Norling said to me, now, John, remember that it's okay to say to your people, I don't know. Because, you know, especially as a young pastor, you want to have all the answers. You don't want to seem foolish. And I was young. I want to make sure that I didn't seem foolish. And he said, remember now, as 
There's nothing wrong in saying, I don't know. And so for 45 years, I've been saying, I don't know. I, I, don't, I don't know. I, I know that, that God's character is love. And um, I know that he has a purpose and that ultimately it all works together for good, but I really don't understand. A few years ago, it was my privilege to be listed in um, Who's Who in American Religion, and I had to fill out a form, and I didn't think of anything of that, you know, your name, is that, who your parents are, what degrees you have, where you, where you, you may have taught or spoken, and so on. And then, the clincher, I didn't know this was going to happen. But I had to write in one sentence um, some major lesson I'd learned, some major uh, principle by which I live, something that, that really made an impression upon me in one sentence. Now, what pastor can say anything in one sentence? <laughs> so I fudged. I'll show you the sentence, and you'll notice I fudged a little bit. But this is, this is it. The older I grow, the more I experience life, the greater is my confidence in and reliance upon the sovereignty of God. I don't know. But he is sovereign. He is control. I don't always understand. And I know that sovereign God who is in control has a character of love. And I know that he has a purpose, and whatever happens for me ultimately is to my good, even though I don't understand. And so understanding then God's character, I can then open myself to his leadership. But secondly this morning, to really understand God's will and to be at peace about it, you need to be assured that you can indeed experience God's leading. There, there's a problem of believing, a salvation once a person really comes to believe salvation, you know, it's kind of easy because the Bible says everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And so Christians sometimes will come to that point, okay, um, I trust the Lord for salvation. I'll trust him for eternity. But I'm not quite sure about my day-by-day -day life. If he, if he really is involved in my decision-making. And sometimes uh, as you look for his guidance, uh, the decision-making seems like he really doesn't want you to know. And, and it's important to realize that um, God does want us to know. Uh, I think of a game that came recently on the email to me. It was called uh, Cat Checkers. Maybe it came to you. And as I played that game, I thought, you know, that's how people think God's will is. And you, there's a cat there, and then you, you know, he jumps, and then you, you jump and you never can win. He always goes, he, the cat will get to the edge, and then he disappears. Now, they say that you, it is possible to win that. If I have sent that to you, uh, well, you're probably not here. You're probably in an insane asylum because it drove you absolutely crazy. It says you can win, but I've never won. And, uh, well, I, of course, didn't play it that long, but it, it's like you just can't win. You get almost, the cat's gone. And uh, one person emailed me back. He said, I did it in one try. I thought, I hope you realize what God does to people who lie. <laughs> but look, at the, somebody, that's God's will, you know. And, and, you know. He really doesn't want me to know, and I, and I keep trying to find it. It's gone. Or someone else sent me an email, and it said uh, that I had won, I think it was $100,000, and just a click on the X, and uh, it would give me the address. Well, you got that one, you barely get to the X and it moves. And so I sneaked up with the arrow right next to it and then whoosh, real fast and still got away. There's no way you can get the X. And uh, I don't have my $100,000. But some people look at God's, oh, God, yeah, it's God's will. God plays with us. Oh, here, and he dangles his will out and he takes it away. And, but that's not the way it is because... Uh, James writes in chapter 1, verse 5, if you need wisdom, if you want to know what God wants you to do, ask him and he will gladly tell you. That's important to remember that God's not playing cat checkers with us. He's not saying, you know, click on the X and be fooled. But he really 
wants us to know so that we can be at peace. Well, finally this morning, as we think of God's will, we need to be aware that God leads in four basic ways. And this is good to remember because we all make decisions. Uh, Going to school, the beginning of life maybe, or what retirement center do I enter at the end of my life, or, uh, you know, or what mortuary should I use, right? I mean, you're making decisions all the way through, and basically God leads in these decisions in four ways. First of all, he leads with an emphatic no. And you want to remember that when God says no, his no's are positive. I think of the story of the man who toured an insane asylum. He uh, was taken around by the director of the institution, and they were looking at various wards. Then they came to the, um, uh, the, the uh, you know, well, the uh, ward where people were kept in solitary confinement in padded walls. They were just totally out of it. But there was a window, and you could look in and see the patient. And the first window they looked in, there was a patient in there who was banging his fists on the wall in anger, just bang, bang, bang. And the the uh, visitor said, well, wh- what's his problem? And he said, well, it's kind of a long story. He was, fell in love with this girl named Mary. And uh, when he asked her to marry him, she said no. And it's driven him crazy. He's in here, and he's just banging his hands on the wall. Went to the second uh, room and looked in. There was a man who was banging his head on the wall. Bang, bang, bang. And so the visitor, well, what's wrong with him? He said, well... He also fell in love with Mary. And um, when he asked her to marry him, she said no, and he went berserk, and he's in here banging his head on the wall. Third room, there's a man even worse yet. He's banging his fists on the wall and his head. It was head, bang, fists, bang, head, back and forth. And the visitor said, ah, I know. He didn't get married. And the jury said, oh, no, 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 that's the guy that got married. (laughs) Sometimes no can be positive, you know, and especially if God says no, hey, remember, it's for your good. He's leading us out of a heart of love. And if he says no, it's for our good. So never seek God's leading when he says no or for any forbidden acts, such as uh, drunkenness. Oh, it's Friday night. I've had a tough week. Should I go out and get drunk? Well, no. The Bible says don't get drunk in 1 Corinthians 6, 9. Should I marry an unbeliever, for example? Uh, or rather, drunkenness in Galatians 5, 21. Should I have premarital sex? We've been going together a long time now. And Well, no. The Bible is very clear that that's not sex is outside of marriage is sin. Or marrying an unbeliever. Don't do it. And uh, I can bring people from our very church family here and say, yeah, believe that. I tried it, and it doesn't work because God says no, and it's for our good. Well, sometimes God leads with an emphatic yes. We never have to seek the leading of the Lord for any act about which there is already some commandment in God's word. Should I love my wife? Yes. Ephesians 5.25. Should I respect my husband? Well, yes. Ephesians 5.22. Should I obey my parents? Yes. Ephesians 6, 1, and on and on. Certain things, where it's in the Word of God, it's very, very clear. But how about some of these areas that are not clearly addressed in Scripture and you're struggling with them? For an example, let's take a student, a high school student who has applied to various uh, universities and has received a scholarship, full scholarship from three. We'll say that uh, on the left here, uh, we'll just assume that's Harvard. Uh, So they say, yeah, Harvard said, we'd like you to come. You have a full scholarship. But at the same time, a a Midwestern university, which was far greater than Harvard, in the state of, um, they said, uh, yeah, yeah, also, that would be the University of Minnesota. Minnesota. Yeah, so the person gets, oh, yeah, full scholarship, come to us. And then on the West Coast, um, let's say Stanford for no other reason. I don't know what building, if that's from Stanford or not. But you have these three gigantic, well, two gigantic institutions plus one super gigantic, and they all are offering you full scholarships. And you pray and pray and pray, and God doesn't seem to, to answer. Well, what do you do? Well, um, the third third thing you need to remember is that sometimes God says yes, sometimes no, but oftentimes it's according to your preference. 
in the majority of our decisions, God expresses no choice but leaves us to our pre-personal bent. So what, what, what college do you want to go to? God, God really doesn't really care as long as you're well, following him. Remember uh, Psalm 9, 79, verse 13. We are your people, the sheep of your pasture. God looks at us as sheep. He leads us as sheep. And so when God leads us, he may say, here, here's the pasture. Here are some schools. You pick what you want. You see, a shepherd leads the sheep into a pasture, but he doesn't tell each sheep, you eat this blade of grass and you eat that one, but says, here's, here's the pasture. Hey, go ahead and uh, eat wherever you want. As you look at pictures of shepherds and sheep, you'll notice, however, that the shepherd is often standing. The sheep are free to roam wherever they want to roam, but the shepherd is standing. Why does he stand? Or if you ever see a picture of a shepherd who is seated, he's always sitting on a rock or something, so uh, you can always see his head above the heads of the sheep. Why is that? And so the normal answer is, well, the shepherd stands or sits on a rock so that he can see the sheep. But that's not the answer. The reason the shepherd stands or sits on a rock is so that the sheep can see him. And you see, God oftentimes in life says, hey, here's the pasture. You know, pick the university you'd like to go to, but keep your eyes on me. Keep your eyes on me, and that's the important part, that you need to follow me, and you need to let me lead you. Have you ever heard of the name Dr. Donald Gray Barnhouse? Some of the older folks may have. Dr. Barnhouse was for years pastor of 10th Presbyterian Church in Philadelphia. Great expositor. I think he was in that church 30, 40 years. Uh, He preached through the book of Romans, Every Sunday for 14 years, you'd come, and he would go verse by verse through Romans. I have his four-volume series on much of what he preached. He was a brilliant fellow, very, very bright, a PhD of his day, but not much of a personality. He was kind of a gruff and rough guy, and he didn't spend much time talking to people, but he was very, very bright and understood God and how God operated Well, there was a young man, a little boy in that town named Howie, and Howie came to know Christ as Savior through um, a a friend who had a Sunday school, or actually Saturday school, in the uh, tenements. And Howie was living in the tenements, and he he came and came to know Christ through that young man's work on Saturdays, and eventually Howie came to attend 10th Presbyterian Church. Howie uh, eventually became Dr. Howard Hendricks, who became the distinguished professor of Christian education at Dallas Theological Seminary, and in his 80s is still teaching. Well, Dr. Hendricks, as he reached his teens, wanted to know God's will. What is God's will? What should I do? So uh, he trailed Dr. Barnhouse well, after a service one day as he left the, his, uh, the podium and went to his office, and he just called behind, Dr. Barnhouse, Dr. Barnhouse, I need to know how to find God's will. Dr. Barnhouse, I need to know God's will for my life. Dr. Barnhouse, I... and so Dr. Barnhouse, in his gruff voice, simply turned to him, and uh, he said, 90% of God's will is found above your neck. <laughs> and he went into his office. But he's right. of God's will is right up here in your brain. Because God wired you, remember Psalm 139, when you were a baby. He wired you different than me. And he has wired us so that the way we think is oftentimes, you know, God is led by God. God decided that before I was born. And so 95, 90% of God's will is, is in our minds as God has given us abilities and given us talents, and we begin to use that in um, his, in his life, life, living for him. Someone has said, in almost everything in life, God is pleased when we are pleased. Dr. Howard Sugden was one of the great preachers, I think, sort of a mentor in a sense, although I didn't spend a lot of time with him. He's now, of course, with the Lord. But he said, for the sincere, devout follower of Christ, those are key words, the sincere, devout follower of Christ it is more difficult to get out of God's will than it is to remain in his will. 
you're following the Lord, you're keeping your eyes on the shepherd, it's very difficult to get out of his will. And then finally, by spiritual guidance, that sometimes uh, God in a very special way will guide you. We read in Isaiah chapter 48, verse 17, I am the Lord your God who teaches you what is best for you, who directs you in the way you should go. So how does he direct us spiritually? Oftentimes through counsel from mature Christians, make sure they're mature, and often just by common sense. One of the great preachers that I heard when I was in seminary was Dr. Alan Redpath. Dr. Redpath pastored the Moody Church, and he came to L.A. at the time I was studying there to the First Covenant Church one Monday night, and I was able to go hear him preach. A tremendous communicator. He preached for 57 minutes, and uh, you listened the whole time. He was a tremendous, uh, uh, tremendous speaker. I was t- studying preaching in seminary, and they said, if you don't hit oil, if you don't strike oil in 20 minutes, stop boring. Well, um, I, somehow I never was able to really digest that, so I never have done that. But um, I was being taught that. At the same time, I heard Dr. Redpath preach for 57 minutes, and uh, so I patterned myself more after him. But anyway, uh, it was fantastic. I didn't realize, after I studied about him, he'd never been to seminary, never been to Bible school. He was an accountant. And he since God's called a pastor, and so he just uh, became a pastor and became a very famous pastor, for, uh, not only in England and uh, in Scotland, but in, in uh, America as well. But it was uh, Dr. Alan Redpath who, in determining God's will, did it this way. You might try it. Took a piece of paper, said pros and cons, and he made a list. Why he should stay as an accountant or why he should not. Why he should become a pastor. And he simply made a list and um, followed it that way. You say, well, that that's, can't be God. That's uh, common sense. And, um, but, you know, that is very, very spiritual. Remember uh, good old Martin Luther, the leader of the Protestant Reformation, said God is apt to lead along lines of common sense, but leave room for the unusual. God is God who probably will lead you according to common sense, but keep your mind open for the unusual. Well, this morning, kind of putting all these thoughts together, you can kind of conclude by just saying that, you know, God still guides, and that's one thing that will never change. As a congregation, God's going to guide us through this time of transition. God still guides, and uh, God guides your life whether you're sort of uh, at the beginning of life making decisions about a career or you're nearing the, the, those sunset years and you have to make some decisions or, or anywhere in between, God still guides. Sometimes yes, sometimes no, sometimes maybe, sometimes you've got to be kidding. But uh, God does lead as we seek his will. When I went to seminary, I took a course in evangelism and the, uh, the textbook, was How to Give Away Your Faith. It was written by Paul Little. It was a key textbook in evangelism umpteen years ago when I was in seminary, and it is today as well. It's a, it is a masterpiece on evangelism, written by Paul Little. Paul Little was a professor of evangelism at Trinity Divinity School, Uh, He was in his 30s when he became a teacher there, and unfortunately, in his 30s, was in a very severe car accident and lost his life. But Paul Little left with us, before he went to be with the Lord, this very key volume, How to Give Away Your Faith, that is used for for, for decades now as we've trained men and women for the ministry. But Paul wasn't always interested in in evangelism or being a professor. In fact, he was thinking of being a business major. At that time, he heard of a conference called Urbana. Right now, you'll see some advertisements for Urbana 12. But Urbana was founded in about 1946. Actually, I think it was in Toronto. But by 1948, Urbana has met every so many years in Urbana, uh, Illinois, at the university. It's a big big conference for uni college and university students where they're exposed to missions and they're giving their lives into the service of the Lord. 
either you know, through their work here or maybe in full-time work. Well, Paul Little attended Urbana in 1948. He was trying to determine God's will. He had gone to seminars. What is God's will? He had read books. What is God's will? He had interviewed with pastors. You know, how do I know God's will? He had listened to sermons. How do I know God's will? Then he came to Urbana, and his life was changed by one sentence. There was a speaker there, Dr. Norton Sturett, and um, he made this comment. How many of you who are concerned about the will of God spend five minutes a day asking him to show you his will? And Paul Little thought, man, I've... I've read books, I've gone to seminars, I've interviewed people, I've listened to sermons, but I don't even give five minutes a day in prayer. So that's what he did. And today we have the result of his short ministry as men are being trained and women are being trained today through how to give away your faith. Because God answered prayer for him. And God will answer prayer for us as we seek God's man to continue leading the work of Crossroads Church. And in your life, wherever you are, whatever you're struggling with, God will lead you, too. You're going through a rough time, and maybe you don't say, how how can this be good? Remember, God's sovereign. I don't understand it either, but his character is love. He's a God who has a purpose. And he has a God who leads. Maybe no, maybe yes, maybe your preference, maybe in a special way. But he still leads according to his will. So if you can't trace his hand, trust his 